It's starting to look a lot like, well, unless you're in Vegas, like I am, then it doesn't look like Christmas at all, unless there's a couple of uh, little wreaths around on the on the fence. It's uh, approaching Christmas, and it's In Goal Radio, the podcast. I'm Darren Millard, your host. Today we have a special In Goal car ride with Kevin Woodley, with Buffalo Sabre goaltender Carter Hutton. We'll also go out to Source for Sports Surrey, the hockey shop, thehockeyshop.com, for a new segment called Ask Cam. You have to be very clear when you say that because we do not swear. We do not offer uh, blue language on this podcast. So it's Ask Cam at Source of Sports, the hockey shop, the hockey shop.com with Kevin Woodley as I bring in the co founders of Ingle Magazine, David Hutchison and Woody. Uh, Woody, um, this, is a, this is a great new segment that you've got going. Yeah, like you said, as long as you stress the enunciation of the K in ask, Otherwise, mm-hmm. you know, we will end up with an <laughs> cam, and that's not that's not what right. we want. Now yeah. I gotta bleep that out too. Yeah, Woody. Jeez, yeah. I got a lot of work on these shows now. Guys are pretty chill when they're riding in Woody's car, so some language comes out, and I have to pull out the beeper, and it's okay. It's okay. We're getting great content. It's worth the effort. The only reason I know that you have to really enunciate that segment is because I listened to Woody say it, and I went, "Did he really just say?" What? No, no, no. He meant that. So I listen. Hey, listen, I didn't say it. Remember, well, I was trying to come up with a jingle. I actually <laughs> I actually was singing it. So, well, you know, so for our listeners out there, if you've got a suggestion for an ask cam jingle, something we can put together and make this a regular segment. Um, you've heard me talk about the hockey shop and the hockey shop dot com is the place I go to buy my gear. It's also the place that you can go to at, get your questions answered. Um, every week when we go to the hockey shop, Cam throws out the number. The reality is they have all their entire staff is goaltenders that play the position, love the position, know the position, know your gear, know how it works, know how it fits. So we decided instead of just letting our audience always call Cam and his staff to ask questions about what they should buy in that great department full of great gear, what's going to work best for them. Why don't we have them submit a few questions? We took a few of them to Cam and yeah, we're going to mix it up in the uh, gear segment here on out. We're going to have the odd ask cam. So if you've got gear questions, uh, you're too afraid to ask, make sure you email them to podcast at ingoldmag.com. Sorry, Hutch, I know that's your job, but podcast at ingoldmag.com. We'll take those questions to cam and we'll mix it up every once in a while. We'll do an ask cam segment. Uh, I really like this one. It was a good start. And so we're looking forward. We're, we're mixing things up. We're starting new ideas here on the Ingold Radio Podcast. Now we just need a jingle and a few more questions, folks. He will have a jingle. By the time this, this thing gets put together, our production staff will have uh, creatively assembled a beautiful jingle. Our production staff, not staffers, staff, singular. <laughs> <laughs> it I is what it is. There, there better be more than one because this guy's not very musical. The, uh, the other side is uh, if you're driving to the game, listening to the podcast, like I know uh, a lot of parents do with your uh, goaltenders, uh, we, uh, we are proud to say that we have uh, we put three more teenagers in the car with you as we have fun with the Ask Cam language. Just just wanting to make you feel at home. Uh, Carter Hutton is going to join us on the, uh, the podcast, and uh, that uh, feature interview also leads us to, to uh, some great new content at Ingle premium hutch yeah it's been a fantastic week we launched in goal premium what just over a week ago very quietly and carefully and just to make sure we had all the bugs out and people started to uh, started to come and um can't really share specific names because of course when you sign up it's uh, private data but it's pretty exciting that uh, we found out that some nhl coaches some american league coaches some professional goaltenders have signed up uh, it's, it's quite the list of people. In fact, we're, we're really heavily skewed to the, uh, the people who are deep in the, uh, goaltending community already. So want to see a lot more people like just casual fans and parents come and join us. In fact, I think we're going to be adding, uh, next week, we're going to start adding in some content specific for goalie parents as well. So, uh, even though we go pretty deep into things here, we're, we, we've also got stuff for everybody. So come check out all the fantastic content at Ingold Premium. There are things like Kevin Woodley sitting down with Freddie Anderson and going over some of his best saves and exactly what he saw, what he read, how he reacted. Carey Price as well. Um, We've got some pro tips with guys like Carey Price, guys like uh, Rob Tallis, the Florida Panthers goaltending coach. We've got 
today's guest, Carter Hutton, walking us through his gear in the locker room. Uh, all sorts of fantastic exclusive content that we haven't been able to bring to you until now. And uh, we're just really excited that it's off the ground and, and running. Kevin, uh, what have I missed? Not much, Hodge. I think you got most of it. Um, remember, we'll have some deeper dive technical articles, but there are going to be some quick hits, little drills that you can take out onto the ice yourself. I thought a good one uh, from our first week featured Connor Hellebuck and Lorraine Bossois doing a skating drill. James Jansen, goalie coach for the Everett Silvertips, and Dustin Wolf, who will probably be the World Junior Team for, for the USA, um, walked us through a simple little three lines that he draws on the ice, three different patterns that he used to get rotation. And the lines actually create good sort of markings and measurement points for how well your goalie's squaring up to his new spots. So we got Connor Hellebuck running through that drill and James Jansen explaining it. We're going to add some material this week. I'm actually meeting later today with Adam Francilia. Listeners of the podcast will recognize that name. A Fran, Adam Francilia is the trainer that works at Net360 Goalie Camps that we attend every summer. I literally have three summers of off-ice drills uh, featuring NHL goaltenders like Hellebuck, like Brassois, like James Reimer, like Devin Dubnik. And we're going to meet with him later today to go through some of those drills, have him outline them, and then we'll add the footage from the NHL guys executing them. Uh, if you're listening, Devin Dubnik, I've got some footage that you might want to pay me to not use on there. Just kidding. Um, and yeah, so we're, that's another segment that we'll have monthly that we're going to add later this week. So those are the kind of things you'll find at In Goal Premium. Um, yes, it is a paid product because yes, it does cost us a lot of money to go around and get these tips and take video cameras into the room. Um, there is a real cost to producing it. You don't have us. to justify it, man. It is awesome. Well, for us to produce it on a regular basis, yeah. we used to do this stuff there. And like, and we've had like Mackenzie Blackwood told me he used to read our digital magazine with a page turner PDF. And a lot of people love that magazine. Our, our, we had like 20,000 readers a month every time we did that magazine. The problem with making it free was we couldn't keep it up because it was costing us money to produce it. So this is just the reality. To get back to that type of content on a weekly and monthly basis requires this to run like a business and that requires us charging for it. So I know not everyone loves paying for content, um, but we can promise you we're trying to bring you exclusive content that nobody else does yeah. and hopefully make it worth your investment. Hey, and I think you said it best, Kevin. Uh, we all have to sharpen our skates. It's also important to sharpen our goalie minds. And uh, this is going to cost you less than a skate sharpening a month at uh, $50 for a year for Canadians. If you're in the United States like Darren is right now, that's 37 bucks. So uh, not a whole lot to subscribe. The other thing we didn't mention is that we're putting exclusive podcast content on there as well. So today's feature interview uh, has been up there for a couple of days. And uh, there's been some extra stuff. Uh, Kevin interviewed Koskinen's trainer uh, in Finland for an NHL.com piece. We've got some recording from that on there. So we're always trying to find a few little tidbits, a uh, little bit extra for our subscribers. And if you're looking uh, for InGoal Premium, it's really easy. You go to InGoalMag.com and it's all laid out for you right there. I know I know. there's other, like, eventually you'll have to click on links and blah, blah, blah. But it's like full I just went there. It was the Rob Tallis, James Reimer puck handling. Like it was, it was laid out for you perfectly and then just uh, sign up and, and enjoy the content. It's uh, it's outstanding uh, on the subject of, uh, of puck handling. Uh, Dougie Hamilton this week fooled uh, Mika Koskinen. Uh, regular folks will say that that's a terrible goal. It's not a good goal, but we've just for the record, we've all been there, right? Where you try whether Pretty somebody much. fakes the rim and then throws it on net and, and they Pretty score. Pretty much, but, and every, every goalie coach on the planet has tried to do it to a kid in practice as well. Right. But look, I think you said it, Darren. If, if Dougie Hamilton's dumping him from center with a slap shot, how else are you getting back there to stop that thing? So if you want him back there doing that work, you got to read it and like try and beat it. It's going to happen occasionally. Yeah. And Dougie's, Dougie's good at it too. He's tried this a few times and like it was, it was hard. It wasn't fake stop shoot. It was set up to dump and in one motion while taking the slap shot for a dump, turning the stick and cranking it high blocker. And there was an oiler between Koskinen and the dump uh, and providing a screen. So he would have had no way of seeing that stick turn. It's, you know, it's like the bad hop from center ice that all of a sudden skips over the glove and everyone's like, oh my gosh, that looks terrible. And it does. We're not trying to excuse it. It looks terrible. But sometimes that one that skips five feet in front of you and bounces over your glove, it's the difference between that and a tip five feet in front of you. We don't blame goalies on that. 
Um, I'm not letting him off the hook completely, but no, 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 man, no, you are because you happens. just you, you just throw throw out the guy with screen from center ice. <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe I'm being a little easy on him. I like uh, Nico. Come on. I, I blame, this is the goalie uh, union. Yeah, I blame Mike Smith. I, I I totally blame Mike Smith trying to keep up with uh with his with his goalie partner, which there's there's legs to that. Where you oh, try I've, and try and match his or at least be better than than you normally are or more effective than you normally are. We saw with David Riddich in uh, Calgary last year where he was, mm-hmm. and, and he's actually, and that's the thing, like sometimes you can try too much because Mike Smith's so damn good at it. You can try too much to sort of keep up with the Smiths, so to speak. And with Riddick, there were times he did, but the Flames watched his puck handling get a lot, like his puck handling improved significantly. And so maybe there were a few hiccups, but kind of like Mike Smith told us years and years ago, you can't be afraid to get out there and try it again, even when you make a mistake. And for Riddich, yeah, there may be some mistakes early, but like he's become a much better, better puck handler overall as a result. Every once in a while, you got to live with one of these. Uh, we have a, a pretty strong rotation here of the three of us uh, sharing the net, uh, sharing the microphone. Uh, the New York Islanders are 29 games into it. Uh, don't roll your eyes. You get you get lots of time editing out Woody's issues. Hutch. I was just trying to decide what sort of shot I could take at Woody for trying to hold the net for too long. He's, he definitely oh, yeah. sees himself as a number one, doesn't he? If you're if if the, if we were a warm up though, like a pregame warm up, Woody takes all the shots. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And and then we might get in there for for the little drill at the end uh, before before everybody goes to the dressing room. Uh, Twenty nine games in, the New York Islanders have rotated their goaltenders uh, right through, and this is a, a good little reminder for everybody in minor hockey that it's, it, if you can do it, do it. There's no reason why somebody has to play two, three games in a row, and then the other guy play a couple of games. Like you can go back and forth every game. I love it. They're doing the peewee rotation. I think it's fantastic. It's keeping guys fresh. But uh, Kevin, speaking of peewee rotations, what was the uh, what was the Alex Ald story about coaching? He, um, I we want some goalie parent content. Here's some great goalie parent content. Didn't you tell me at one point he was coaching a team and he was rotating his goaltenders every ten minutes? Yeah, they were trying that last year, and now we're gonna have to get him on the podcast to talk about that experiment. I don't know if it was oh, every ten minutes, but in instead of rotating them back and forth within a game and having this kid sit cold because Alex was on the bench as an assistant coach, they were rotating within the game. I don't know if it was half a game or a period or every 10 minutes. So the kid would come to the bench and Alex could actually talk to him and help him improve and walk him through different situations. So, and both kids played every game. It was an interesting concept and we've basically set that up to be a nice little conversation with Alex. I think we'll, we'll have to add that for the podcast and as a bonus episode next week. Um, but at the NHL level, clearly you're not doing that. Although Robin Lehner might wish maybe that the Blackhawks would do it for shootouts soon enough. Um, <laughs> but but they're another team that does it, not to the uh, yeah. rigid uh, uh, format of of the New York Islanders right now. But uh, but the Blackhawks are pretty close to that. Yeah, and they they have been going back and forth. And think about it, guys. So in an era where increasingly we talk about the need for two goaltenders and goalie rotations and 1A and 1B and you can't ride a workhorse starter too much unless maybe you're the Toronto Maple Leafs and you're determined to play the wheels off Freddie Anderson this year. Um, why not? Like if you've mm. got two guys and Barry Trotz did this last year, not as not at back and forth every game, but for a, for long stretches, he did it last year. And I talked to him about it and he's like, listen, like I, I just dug up the quote from last year. He's like, it's happened before in my coaching career. I'm not going to say it's going to happen now in the playoffs, but if you look at the save percentage, the wins, the losses, they are pretty well virtually the same. And we've seen it with Laner and Grice this year, last year. We're seeing it with Varlamov and Grice this year. And so if you're those goalies, like let's be honest, every goaltender in the NHL at every level wants to play every game. That's how we're built. That's how why we become goaltenders. We don't want to leave the ice. But if you're forced to play less than you'd like, why not go back and forth? And this goes all hmm. the way back to conversations I've had with goalies about it. Vesa Toskala and Evgeny Nabokov with the San Jose Sharks in, I believe, was it 06, 07? It was 06, 07. Who was Both the coach? Of them, Ron Wilson, okay. coaching the Sharks at the time, back and forth every game like the Islanders are doing now, right until a mid-February injury to Toskala put Nabokov into the driver's seat. And I remember talking to Ron Wilson that year. And at that point, before the injury, he, he hadn't committed to maintaining it for the playoffs. But there was no sign of stopping it. And if you're a goalie, like, 
your perfect world, you're playing every game because goalies talk about rhythm and feeling good and not having to worry about, oh, if I have a bad game, I'm not going to get back in the net. Well, the rotation eliminates all of that. Like to me, winning you're in is the stupidest philosophy a coach can have because all you do is add none unnecessary pressure to a position that's already full of it. And so by going back and forth, yeah, every game rhythm is perfect. But you know what the next best thing is if you're going to have to split a workload? Every second game rhythm. Because it's still a rhythm. You still know. And mm-hmm. if you maintain the rotation, there's no, oh, I had a bad game. I might have to sit for a week. You know, it's not that like nobody wants a bad game, but remove that pressure because you know that, you know, yeah, okay. You know, if I'm, if I'm Thomas Grice, not that, <laughs> not that that guy feels any pressure ever. I lost this one, but I'm going to get to go in two games from now. Varley's got the next one. I got the next one. Like it just, it makes sense on a lot of levels, especially when the starter and the backup are statistically at least indistinguishable. And, it, and as long as there's not huge discrepancies in their game in terms of how they play or how they handle the puck, maybe changing how your defensemen have to react to them, then it makes a lot of like Toskala and Nabokov. We think about them style wise, they were very similar. In a lot of ways, both sort of old school, narrow butterfly, a little more stand up in style. And guess what, boys? It's actually worked in the playoffs all the way to a championship. Which league? The American Hockey League. So it hasn't been used in the NHL. I'm I'm real eager to see if any coach. See, has I, knew, the, I knew you were you were going down a path because you said to a championship and you didn't say Stanley Cup. Right. So I don't know that it's ever worked in the Stanley Cup, but it led the Albany River Rats. Well, no. To, um, Johnny Bauer and Terry Sawchuk? Could, they? could be, but dad will have to look that up while I talk about the 1995 Albany River Rats. I'll just River try to remember when I was at those games. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with old age is it's hard to remember those moments, Hutch. Yeah. Um, so it was Corey Schwab and Mike Dunham, 1995 Albany River Rats. They alternated. Um, the entire playoffs. They've been doing it in the regular season. Robbie Fatorik was the coach, and I guess he just decided, you know what? It was working in the regular season. Let's just keep going into the playoffs, back and forth, all the way to a Calder Cup American Hockey League championship. Dunham was a rookie that year. Every single game, they alternated. They won the Calder Cup, and they shared the MVP award. So it's happened before. I'm not saying it's going to happen in the NHL, but again, Uh, you know, it removes a lot of the decision-making. It removes a lot of the pressure. And I know you, if a, if a goalie gets on a heater and the other guy starts stinking for two or three starts, obviously you're going to shift. But as long as everyone's going good, I I just don't understand why everyone's so resistant. We're we're, like the Islanders are a great story. Yeah. You have to have the right, uh, right combination. Nobody's saying you, you do it with, with, uh, Patrick Waugh and, uh, an ECHL guy. So nobody's saying that, but the New York Islanders are a great example that you can do it uh, under different looks because a year ago won the Jennings trophy with Robin Leonard and Thomas Grice. And this year they're 29 games in uh, with a different combination, Grice and Varlamov. It's, it's really interesting. And if you have the luxury to do it, as, as Woody said, an injury comes along and now the other guy's ready to go. I mean, if you had, if Toronto, God forbid, has an injury to Freddie Anderson, what happens? Um, if but you're not suggesting the, the Leafs go no, no, one, no, no, no. one, one, I, one. I started that with the yeah. if you have the okay. luxury. Sorry, I wasn't listening um, again. But but yeah, nobody does. It's all right. Um, <laughs> 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 but the Islanders clearly have the luxury. So should anything happen, they're not going to miss a beat. You're, and you're right, Darren, about personalities. It's got to be the right guys. And Thomas Grice, like Freddie Anderson's just through town, obviously spent some time with him. and the calmness of him on and off the ice, like his presence is so, he just seems so chill and he looks manic compared to Thomas Grice. Like Thomas Grice might be the most water off a duck's back goaltender I've ever met in my life. So you got to have the right personality for it. And Grice certainly fits that bill. Should also toss in that Edmonton does a similar rotation, but they go every two games, Uh, Smith and Koskinen. Same type of thing, but uh, but Dave Tippett decides to play his goaltenders in back to back and then switch and goes every then two another games. W- another one from my childhood, guys. Um, St. Louis Blues second season, Glenn Hall, Jacques Plant. Hall played forty one games, Plant thirty seven. Wow! But but did they alternate? 
Well, g- give me a little more time. I'll figure that out. I can't, I, I'm trying to remember. I, I, I remember when I was at the second game. No, I, I no guys. I was, I was barely crawling then. He, it's, it's very hard to look that one up because you have to go through the stone tablets and those things are heavy. Yeah, no, I, I, I did sort of recall that they, that they had done that. So I wanted to, to look up the games played. But we'll did see. you just give yourself a chest bump, uh, uh like a little, or was teeny, he, you, teeny. Oh. <laughs> well, the, the problem for Hutch is the stone tablets are hitting, but hidden behind the gear that he used to wear, the brown leather pads in the corner of the office that we, that we can see as we do this over Skype. And our listeners are like, what the hell is he talking about? And not only I'll are the stone those. tablets heavy, but the, the old pads Hutch used to wear, there's like 20 pounds each too. Our, uh, our feature interview this week is Carter Hutton as he rides in Kevin's car. We will get to that. But first, a, uh, a trip out to Source for Sports Surrey. The Hockey Shop, thehockeyshop.com, and at Source for Sports Surrey, we are unveiling a brand new segment. Woody. It's, 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 it's Ass Cam, Ass Cam. Do, 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 it's Ass Cam. Do, 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 it's Ass Cam. calling the hockey shop source for sports in Surrey, BC. To hear our store hours and locations, press 1. To reach our sales staff, press 2. Hockey shop source for sports. Mike speaking. Yeah, hey, I uh, I could use the help uh, with a couple goalie questions. I was wondering if there's anyone there that could help me. Sure, yeah, for sure. Just one moment. I'll talk to one of the goal guys for you. Thank you. Thanks for rolling. It's Cameron speaking. Cameron? How's it going, Kevin? Cameron? Yeah, I always answer as Cameron. Wow, we have something new we discovered. Welcome to the new segment on In Goal Radio, the podcast. We decided to mix things up. We'll do this probably once a month, maybe a little more often, where we're going to allow listeners to submit questions to our expert at the hockey shop, thehockeyshop.com, Cam Matwiv. Uh, we're changing things up, Cam. It was a good idea by you. Uh, the only downside to this is uh, we were trying to come up with a name for this segment. May or may not have sung a little jingle uh, and ask Cam if you say it quickly and don't enunciate the K quickly becomes Cam. So um we're gonna try and stick with the former not the latter uh there'll be no camera used in this it'll just be us asking you questions so let's start right off the hop with uh, a question we got um we got actually this is uh this is from margaret and she did not give her location though judging from the email address it's a telus address so somewhere in canada perhaps here in bc anyway she wanted to know why goaltenders have stopped using bootstraps and do you have any recommendations for kids in terms of when or when not to use bootstraps on their pads? Hmm, that, it is a bit of a loaded question to a bit of a degree, but there is a fairly simple answer. That's um, why we came to you. <laughs> so, so originally, you know, if, if we go back, let's call it maybe 10, almost 15 years now, the old adage was that you're cranking that bootstrap down to get max control over that lower portion of your pad but the flip side of it is is that you used to basically hang up your skate on your pad and cause your your blade to almost be parallel with the ice rather than being on an angle putting down so that would put wicked stress on your hips and your knees so kind of what goalies have found out and a lot of um, watching the pros and us kind of reacting to that has been the looser that strap is the more uh the skate is going to fall out of the boot of the pad and get closer to the ice. The closer that skate is to the ice, the faster you can transition out of your butterfly or catch an edge and continue on for your next movement. Um, in terms of when we would recommend kind of, you know, doing this, it's tough because at a, at a young age, it's really important to just get that kid out on the ice. Um, and starting with that is making sure they've got control over the pad. And sometimes if we put things too loose, the kid's just falling out of the pad and, you know, things just start working out. Um, that said, the bootstrap just shouldn't be like if it's so tight that you can't put two fingers in between the actual like cowling of the skate or the holder um, and the bootstrap itself, it's too tight. So 
Um, I'd recommend kind of the two finger rule for now um, as a starting point for that kind of super young age, that kind of novice age. But as you start to get a little older and the um, you know, your young child develops better play habits and whatnot and looking to improve better on the ice, that's when I would loosen that up even further. Okay. And what about removing it altogether? Obviously, we've seen most brands, I think, was Carry the first one? Was Pricer the first one to sort of go no bootstrap? And that started this trend. Most brands now offer you in custom orders the option to have it removed completely. Or I think at retail, for the most part, almost all of them have the opportunity to buy a pad and either leave it on or add it, remove it. I think the Bauer pads come with it not on, but they come with a bootstrap you can easily add yourself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we've seen that kind of develop over and been refined. So you've seen actually things like, for example, the Lundquist loop pop up um, into, uh, into the nomenclature of goalie as well. So what that is, is again, on the back of, uh, most Bauer skates that are produced now, and actually most CCM skates are produced now, there's a little, uh, nylon tab on the back. So that's another place where you could run your bootstrap through. Uh, the reason being is, is that when you're down on the butterfly, if you kind of kick your toes forward towards your pad and kick your heels out, you can kind of kick the overall pad up on you a little bit higher when you're actually down in your butterfly and help seal off the five hole. Um, it was kind of a, an advantage that came when the NHL reduced some of the sizing on the pad. Um, so, you know, like Lundquist, for example, I think it was close to four inches off his pad. He needed to gain that overall height back. And that's kind of while that Lundquist loop came about, for example. Well, and uh, just to provide a little background there, I think first identified in the pages of our old Indigo magazine, uh, the old edition that we used to run the Lundquist loop, uh, or at least first first people to have him talking about and explaining it. So I think when we talk about connectivity and making sure the sort of legs connected to the pad, the Lundquist loop is a nice option. Um, If you run it under the skate, that kind of helps you keep the pad down so you're not coming off that knee stack if that's a connection issue for you as a young goaltender. With the Lundquist loop, you still maintain a bit of that connection to the pad, but it's not pulling it down. Like you said, for him, it allowed the pad to sit higher and close more of the five hole. Um, for other goalies, for different reasons, they might just feel like they need some connection, but they don't actually need that pad snug down, pulled down over top of the of their skate um, in order to maintain the connection on the knee stack when they drop into the butterfly. So that might be a good rule of thumb. The other one I was thinking about too is uh, I go back to a situation I had with Eddie Lack on the ice a uh, long time ago, and he ha- he was actually having ankle pain and was having an issue with his ankle. And I I just I threw it out there. I'm like. Why don't you just take off your bootstrap? A lot of people are taking off their bootstrap. And, and he, the answer he gave me was, well, it's so loose on there. It's not like it's doing anything. And this actually provides with a good checkpoint for goalies of all ages and parents of young goalies is when they get into the butterfly, check to see what that tension is in terms of whether that bootstrap is snug, is pulling their ankle off the ice, is creating uh, any type of resistance that makes it hard for them to get an edge. And in that case, it might be too tight still. So um, in Eddie's case, he didn't. He thought it was so loose it wasn't doing anything, to which I replied, well, if it's not doing anything, why do you have it on there? But when we actually got on the ice and he dropped into the butterfly, you could see the tension pick up in the bootstrap and it was causing resistance at the ankle. And so he took it off. I remember that skate never went back to it. So um, there are benefits to both. I think especially uh, I find that some pads we get on the testing side, they can be a little tall at the knee. So having the bootstrap run under this gate is a good way of holding that down so you don't slip off the knee stack, especially with the all Velcro setups and elastic setups that we're seeing so common in the NHL. That's a good one for there. Also, I like Bauer's gone to their bootstrap and again, removable. You can run it through the back, you can run it through the bottom of the skate, or you can remove it altogether. But the strap itself has actually has some elastic properties too. So it, it provides a little bit of that flex. Uh, even if you do have a little bit of tension when you hit the butterfly, it gives you a little more, there's a little more give there. Exactly, exactly. All right, so there, it was supposed to be the Ask ask Cam segment and Woodley took over. <laughs> hey, Dan Millard and David Hutchison are nodding along um, as this happens. Okay, next one. Uh, and this one comes from Fred in Michigan. We, to be honest, we're not going to give last names because we didn't ask permission. We'll, we'll hit them up next time if we can do it. But Fred in Michigan wants to know, and this is a debate that's going on a little bit on the internet right now. So Fred, excellent, timely question. How do you size a goal stick? There's obviously a debate on whether you cut it or not, but let's start with sizing. How do you size a goal stick and a paddle, especially for kids? Because I think the trend is to go bigger and want a bigger paddle. Um... Because when you go paddle down, not that a lot of people do anymore, you're getting a little more coverage, that concept that a longer paddle covers more ice. But 
That's not always a good thing to have a longer paddle. So how do you fit it with kids right up to adults? How do you how do you get them comfortable? Walk me through the fitting process of helping them choose a paddle length. Yeah. So again, this is a, a common question and there's a bit of deflection that happens here too as well, which we'll explain in, in a minute here. But at, at the very basis of fitting a stick, um, a goalie should uh, go, uh, we should put them into a pair of skates, get them to take a basic stance <clears throat> with the stick. Um, we get to evaluate kind of how, how they're sitting in their stance. Does it look like they're reaching for that stick? Does it look like they're pulling back quite a bit on their shoulder? Um, we want to find that happy medium where it looks like they're in a comfortable crouch. It doesn't look like the stick's too far in front of them, like they're pushing it away from them, or it doesn't look like it's being pulled in too close or you know, not even touching the floor. Now, there are a few different rules of thinking when it comes to, you know, should the stick be touching the ice at all times, or, you know, does it hover a little bit of above when they're in their stance? There's quite a few different guys that have that example. But that said, at a basis, that's what we're looking for. Beyond that, we usually default back. So if you have a goalie coach, they're the ones that are watching you play they'll know if you need a bigger stick or something shorter because they get to see you playing in all aspects. I only get a small snapshot when I'm in the store, when I'm seeing you in your stance, they see you in, you know, all situations that are happening. Usually I default back to them. Did they say you need something bigger? Yes. No. Yes. Great. Okay. We have something here for you. No, you definitely don't need something. Okay. So the one other thing, as you mentioned, we've talked about this with fitting pads, fitting pants, fitting chest and arm. Like you need to have your other pieces of equipment on, obviously putting the skates on puts you in your normal height on the ice versus um, just standing there in your bare feet and not having that same height. So that's a good, good thought process. Do you have them go down into the butterfly? Because if the paddle's too long, it can really start to sort of affect elbow and hand position. It may look good standing up, but they drop and all of a sudden everything sort of pulls back off the puck because the paddle's too long. That, that's correct. So that's kind of the next evolution of, you know, what happens next after that position so again have them drop down on the butterfly see where that stick's lining up see how they're actually sitting um in their butterfly falls on their blockers taking off you know because it's just being pushed up too high because it's too long you know again there's a sign that you know this stick just isn't going to work out um again be surprised usually the smaller stick is the more of the correct answer than the bigger stick and that's definitely the common play that you'll hear um from us um but there are certain situations um especially some older goalies that like to stand up straight Quite a bit more you know they are going to need that taller stick in particular just to match their stance style and um and how they play older goalies you're not talking about anyone in particular are you he better not be taking a shot at me with that <laughs> uh me to know you to find out how do you keep your knee pad from slipping down and this is an email address that i'm going to be honest with you there's no name attached to it um it's got random numbers here, so I'm going to have to look into who asked this and maybe edit it in later. I don't have the asker, but thank you for the question. It is a good one. Um, how do you keep your knee pads from slipping down? Simple roll of tape, or you got other you got other options there in terms of garter belts that can attach to the knees at the top? How do you do it? And, yeah. and what do you recommend as the options? So me personally, um, all, I, all I find I need is actually just a pair of tighter um, nylon socks up and over top of my knee pads. I currently wear the Warrior knee pads in particular. Um, I find they work very well. Um, I, I don't need tape. I don't need anything like that. I just need a garter belt to hold up my socks and my socks go up and over top. And that's it. I don't usually have a problem with them slipping or sliding or moving out of place. Now I usually see a lot of uh, knee pads that, you know, are customers that are having problems with their knee pads. I find that they've maxed out their Velcro and tried to put it as tight as possible. Um, keep in mind that when something is that restricted, it doesn't have anywhere to go, but up or down. Um, so, usually most knee pads are designed to have a bit of a mechanism where they do kind of shift a little to a little bit of a degree. So that allows them to kind of cover that knee when they're down in the butterfly. Um, so the tighter you go on some things, the more that gets restricted, the more it's actually going to promote the knee pad slipping. So for starters, it's always checking about how tight you actually have that knee pad. Um, moving forward from that, um, a lot of knee pads have tabs for garter belts that attach specifically um, to the knee pad itself. Like CCM has their own specific garter belt that they've made for their knee pads that just tab in. It's a little nylon strap. So there's another great way to hold up your knee pads. I always recommend socks over top of those knee pads as well for, again, the reasons that I've described that they work for me, um, but it also slips easier inside the knee cradle and doesn't catch um, on any of your pieces inside your knee cradle as well. It creates a better slip surface for lack of a better term. Um, tape is always an option, but for the same reason that I brought up of putting that knee pad too tight, that's what tape can kind of do as well and actually cause more restriction than it does actually provide any benefit, um, to helping hold up that knee pad in particular. Okay. I'm in the CCM pro one and I have seen those tabs and I have seen the garter belts in, in terms of attaching those tabs 
to a garter belt that goes around your waist. But I got to be honest with you, with that hinge system they have on there uh, and and the way the knee sits in that specially designed pocket, I've had no problems with it slipping without having to add anything. So I love that hinge system and the way it rotates around. But I got to be honest, I, I, I don't wear socks. I've just never thrown on socks over top of my knee pads. And that's a good point you make because especially the new socks, not like the old knit socks, but the new socks in terms of allowing a pad to rotate around a surface that's a little more, for lack of a better term, slippery. There's a little less sort of resistance on those socks and maybe not every once in a while, my knee pad will catch on the knee stack a little bit. I want to try that out, Cam. I've never been, so I always thought I was, that was too much of a keener move, try hard uh, at, at the beer league level to have the socks over top of the knee pads. But now you've convinced me that I'm going to have to, uh, going to have to try it out. So I'll have to steal a set of socks out of my team bag. <laughs> For sure. You know what? It's it's not even like that. It's one of those things that I even found out by trying out kind of myself through my experiences. And I just found it makes such a difference to have that extra slip surface rather than having that knee pad catch on, you know, anything that's there inside your knee cradle. Folks, this is why we call Cam at the hockey shop. This is why we call the hockey shop at what's the number again, Cam? 604-589-8299. 604-589-8299 for all your goaltending questions. Ask Cam and his crew. They play the position. They understand the position. They try different things in experiment like Cam did with socks so that they can have answers for our listeners, answers for the goaltenders that call them, expertise that actually reflects how you play the game and allows you to make a few more saves. Cam, thank you very much. Our first segment of Ask Cam. Uh, We did it over the phone, so it would have that feel like someone calling into the hockey shop to ask a question. But the truth is you guys are probably just getting tired of seeing me, so you want to mix this in once a month. So it's like, oh man, like Woodley again, now you get a week off. You just have to talk to me over the phone. (laughs) <laughs> yeah that could work <laughs> i can picture you're rolling your eyes you're, you're laughing like it's funny but you're like yeah absolutely we're tired of this guy coming in pulling all the sticks off the rack grabbing the gloves seeing what clothes is I, I know i'm a pain in the ass but i thank you for putting up with me and i thank you for taking the time i'm looking forward to this segment we'll mix it into the goal or the goalie gear segment uh every once in a while here on the ingle radio podcast of course brought to you by the hockey shop source for sports in surrey british columbia and the hockey shop.com cam we'll talk to you next week in person buddy awesome thanks kevin well done i like it just jazzing it up with the production value and uh and the fact that uh, you legitimately gave uh, cam a shout on the telephone old school we uh we the only downside to it is I don't get to spend my usual trip out to the hockey shop this week. As much as uh, I enjoyed talking to Cam on the phone, I kind of miss being around all that gear. But for Cam and his crew, it's probably, they're kind of like, oh God, like Woodley didn't come in. That's so good. We don't have to put all the gloves back on the rack that he's been, you know, walking around the shop, opening and closing them. Like I do, I still grab the sticks off the rack. Like just annoying to have to clean up after me. So they probably appreciate the new segment as well. Uh, being around rinks a, a little bit more uh, than I have been the last couple of years, uh, I've noticed some some trends in in equipment that I want to talk to in future episodes. So that just reminded me about uh, putting on gloves and, and trying them on and, and closing them. So just file that one away, okay? And, and keep Absolutely. That one in the I, I would recommend make sure you don't put your hand in the glove that they've just worn in practice. They can be a little gross. Yeah, disgusting. Uh, we're a couple of weeks out from Christmas, so everybody, Source for Sports Surrey, The Hockey Shop, thehockeyshop.com, remake, uh, make sure that you are on it, uh, whether you go to the website at uh, thehockeyshop.com or inside uh, the shop in person. Uh, all your uh, hockey needs, uh, goaltending and skater, uh, anything you would ever need for yourself or your little one, buy yourself uh, your own little gift if um, nobody's looking out for you. It's, uh, it's a wonderful way to, uh, to make sure that you're set up for Christmas and a w- wonderful way to justify it. Well, I was just going to say, and you still have time now if you contact them at thehockeyshop.com or contact them at the phone line that Cam dropped that I called, um, you can still get your gifts in time for Christmas depending on where you live. They've got a pretty good shipping policy. they got a whole crew down there working. They'll get it in a box out the door same day and to you, Still time to get that under the tree to surprise the goalie in your life. And of course, if you are like me and you wait until December 24th to buy gifts for your friends and loved ones and the goalie in your life does not have something goalie related under the tree and you're panicking at the last minute, we like to call it in goal premium one stop shopping. Just click the button 
and give the gift of goaltending for an entire year. And if you live in the States, as Hutch said, $49 Canadian, we're practically, we practically have to pay you with the exchange rate. So in goal premium, also an excellent Christmas gift. Source for Sports Surrey, The Hockey Shop, thehockeyshop.com, and ingoalmag.com, and it's Ingoal Premium. Uh, two perfect uh, gift-giving ideas. Our feature interview is Carter Hutton of the Buffalo Sabres. Woodley, can you set this up for us? It's Carter and Kevin in cars. Um, they had a practice at UBC. The rink wasn't available at Rogers Arena. They had an off day here. Always nice when the guys have an off day because you don't want to have, you know, it's tough. You don't want to bug these guys uh, on a game day, obviously get into, you know, deep, not dark secrets, but sort of deep conversations about their game, the evolution of their game. Not the kind of thing you want to get into on a game day. So love the practice days. They happen to be out at UBC and it was it was just a lot easier to give them a ride back to the hotel than it would have been to stand there in a freezing cold old school rink talking for 25 minutes. So Hutz hopped in. We had a good chat. One of my favorite goalies all time in terms of conversations um, because he you know, he kind of late bloomer and has a lot of good sort of thoughts and introspection about his own game and the game around him. And the kind of guy he is like like he started the season six and oh and he's on a bit of a you know, he's, he's had a, they've had a tougher stretch there in Buffalo. He's been in net for some of their tougher games. Um, not not like he's playing poorly per se, but just not getting the results right now. And still more than willing and gracious with his time to sit down and talk goaltending. And so we wanted to make sure we published this one right away. We have a few in the can, but we wanted to get this one out there because uh, we needed to give Hutz the uh, the in goal bump uh, for, for taking the time to talk. Because there's just so many good insights in here. So I can't wait for people to listen to it. I think they'll enjoy it. There are a lot of little things in here that you can probably apply to your game, whether you're 9, 10, 11, 12, just getting started. Uh, or if you're a beer leaguer, there are things that'll help you stop more pucks, courtesy of Carter Hutton. In the car, Trump's in the can. Carter Hutton on In Goal Radio, the podcast, our feature interview presented by Source for Sports Surrey, the hockey shop, thehockeyshop.com. Okay, so welcome to the podcast, the In Goal Radio podcast, Carter Hutton. Uh, as we get started here, we're actually going to get started driving. You are now the fourth or fifth guest to do the roving sort of <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld comedians in cars routine. Yeah, uh, there's no coffee. Longo is our first one. Yeah, yeah. I should, yeah we got to go should get have coffee. coffee but. No, it's all good. No, this is exciting. I'm, I'm glad you had me on here and, uh, you know, look forward to chatting. Okay, we're going we're gonna to start this simple. We keep this just about the game, how you fell in love with it. I always like to sort of start with where the passion started for you as a goaltender. And we roll from there. Yeah, for me, it was, uh, you know, as a kid is is where it started. You know, I, you know, I grew up in Thunder Bay, Ontario. So it's pretty much snow and hockey, right? That's, you know, majority of the year was spent on the rink or, or somewhere around it. Um, and for me, as a kid, just growing up playing hockey, everyone kind of, you know, gets a turn to play in that, right? When you're at a certain age. And, and that's kind of my backstory. You know, I got a chance to play in that. And uh, at the time, my... I believe my dad and a couple of his buddies were coaching us. I must have been, you know, seven years old or so. And uh, I went net and played really well. And then the backstory is my dad's buddy kept pushing to keep me in net. You know, obviously that competitive edge comes out with the seven and eight year old kids. So, you know, the, the dads behind the bench wanting to uh, try to win. And I, I think for me at that point, obviously, I don't really remember that much, but I, I think just in love with the gear and the you know, what comes with it. And, you know, there from there, just kind of continue to grow. And I think from like eight or nine years old, I've uh, been a goalie now. So it's uh, a few years in the book here. Okay. So your playing partner, Lena Solmark, was chirping you about gear. Um, what though, like, what was there a set you remember growing up? That Was there a gift under the tree even that sort of sparked that passion or it became real for you when you got that? And who was your guy growing up? Um, so growing up, my guy... You know, well, when, as I got older, I always loved Flurry. You know, it's crazy playing against him now. But I think I was in junior when he broke in. So he was the first, like, push pad butterfly guy I loved. And have, then, you, have you told him that? No, no, never, never, never. Um, and uh, I think as a kid, Marty, you know, obviously cool. I got to work with him. He was my goalie coach in St. Louis for a bit. When he was the assistant GM, he was wearing two hats. And uh, he was great. Uh, he helped me a ton with my mental side of the game, you know. I think sometimes the way he saw the game's a little different. You know, he would tell me things and I'd be like, not everyone sees it as easy as you did, Marty, but, you know, he was great, uh, you know, became a good friend too as well. Um, for me, the gear, growing up, I always had, uh, 
my dad's good buddy was the guy that provided the gear for the league that I played in. So he'd always try to get in there and get first dibs just so he couldn't, uh, you know, we didn't go without by any means, but you know, we didn't have a ton of money to waste on brand new hockey equipment. And, uh, I think my first, I had a set of used cohos, the ones that they were the, like Felix Potvin. They had like the eyes and kind of like the, I don't even know what it looked like. It looked like a, like spikes on it, kind of mouth or something. Put some style points in there. Yeah, yeah, those were cool. Those I think I don't think my glove and blocker match, but it was like the discount. And then my first ever set of pads were the, it was Coho's, and they had like the half circles on them to the outside. I don't know which, I don't remember the names or nothing, but those were, and they were blue, gray, and black. And that was like my first real set of pads. Those and those Potvin ones were the ones that I like loved. And I remember getting my first helmet. And then I think I got it painted for like a Christmas gift kind of thing. It was like my dad's buddy who was a painter. So the thing was chipped. You know what I mean? It wasn't done properly in the sense, but it was, you know, something that I, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was amazing to have and so cool as a kid. And, and to this day, I still have every helmet I've ever wore. So it's a cool collection in my house. Does it still like, do you still like, do you play a role in the design? Do you just let your artist take over? Is it still cool to get a new helmet? It still even, is. Even all these years It in? still is cool. It still is a bit of, I, I don't, I can't, I don't play much of a role in it. My guy, uh, Jesse custom designs out of Boston. He does all my helmets and I've had some pretty amazing helmets. Um, we bounce ideas back and forth, but he definitely helps out a lot with it. Um, sometimes my creative side isn't there and, and trying to put, you know how it is like on a helmet, it's such a weird layout, right? Like trying to make it work and not be too busy so you can see stuff. And, but had a, every time he sends me designs in the summer, it's always kind of like a bit of, uh, you know, excitement seeing what he's going to come with. And, uh, you know, especially at this level, right there. They do such a good job on it, so it's always cool to, uh, you know, have that helmet on every night. Whose idea was the sort of the your, your 50th celebration mask this year with the the gold flake? That, that one's got to have a little extra value on it, just literally. Yeah, seriously. He uh, That was all Jesse, honestly. Uh, I, uh, I kind of, the helmet I wear during the year is like half and half, half like kind of like a Terminator Buffalo, half real, kind of cool. I've done that a few times with different teams, with the Hawks and Nashville and and then he came up totally with that fifth. He sent me a sketch and honestly, true, I, I didn't really love it at the start. I kind of was like, but then I thought to myself, you know, it was simple. It wasn't crazy. And then, but one thing I do know and I've learned over time with dealing with paint, the hand drawings never do it justice, you know, until it's on the helmet and it's painted, it, it just pops. It's amazing. And, uh, you know, it's had a lot of good feedback and it's, it's unreal. And I went with the gold cage, which is a little different for me, but. We did the white inside, so I haven't even really noticed the difference at all. It's a matter of trust and sort of trusting your artist. I guess that comes with time. You've worked with Jesse for a while. And I was actually going to ask you about the cage because some guys find color cages are kind of a new rage, but some guys do find that if the color's on the inside, even a little bit of a difference can affect sight lines and how you sort of, you know, between the ears as much as anything. Yeah, we were kind of, you know, I was optimistic about it. My our trainer, Dave Williams, he was the one that kind of said like the gold cage would look awesome. So we, we did a few of them and I have, I have white cages anyway. So I was, I just went into it. Like whatever happens, worst case, I could throw a white cage on quickly. And, uh, but it's been great. It's cool. It goes great with the jerseys and, uh, you know, the jerseys are amazing too, right? They put a lot of effort into designing them. So it, it, it turned out great. Okay. So Thunder Bay, you mentioned being from Thunder Bay and growing up in Thunder Bay. Got a bit of a goalie mafia going on in Thunder Bay these days. I kind of joke about Finnish and Swedish mafia when teams come through with guys from both guys from from those countries. But like the Thunder Bay goalie mafia is strong. Colin yeah. Zulianello still a guy you skate with yeah, in the summer. Yeah, Zuli, Zuli takes all the care other of us. guys out there. Yeah, Zuli's been great. You know, Zuli kind of was the first guy, you know, to come back and really give back. You know, he uh, he's helped us out a lot. You know, with with Murr, with me and Blackwood. So. Murr lives down in uh, Southern Ontario now, I think the last couple summers. So he hasn't been out as much, but me and Blackwood still skate together in the summers. And, uh, you know, having Zuli there has been great. Zuli uh, goes out of his way to make sure that we're accommodated. Um, you know, I can give him a buzz all the time. And, and I don't skate as much as I used to in the summer. You know, I try to wait till August before I really get out there or late July. And we just go out and do sessions together and, and me, him and Blackwood. It, it's been, it's been great. And, and you look at the success, success these guys have had, you know, Matt's had a unbelievable career already and he's just getting started here. He's already got two cups in the bag and, you know, Blackwood's doing a heck of a job here. He's a pretty young kid coming in. He's got all the tools, you know, and he's a, he's a guy that wants to learn too. I feel like every time we skate, he's, you know, picks my brain a bit. He's got all the athletic ability, you know, he's, 
six three, six four, two twenty. He can move. He can do it all. And you know, I think as he starts to learn the game more and more, he's just going to get. Uh, you know, he's going to become a really uh, a household name for sure in the league. Go back to your career a little bit. You talked about when you started and how you started. At what point did this become something where it's like, hey man, I'm pretty good at this, and this might be this might be a career option. Yeah, I, I definitely took a weird path. You know, I, I only had, I played junior in Thunder Bay and then we ended up, I was, I was ready to play junior B the next year and kind of continue on with, I was going to school at the time at, the, at a college. Um, and then we ended up winning the Dudley Hewitt Cup and went to the Royal Bank Cup and I, I got a scholarship offer. So it was kind of one of those things that, you know, the, I got an opportunity and then once I got to college, that's when I really started to develop. You know, I started to realize how hard I needed to work and, you know, the importance of it. And, and then from there, you know, you get the school and teams start, you know, you get agents talking to you and, you know, kind of teams have interest and it starts kind of being a little bit eye opening. And I think at each level, I just kind of learned what I needed to do, right. You kind of adapt to survive and, and you keep working hard to get better and better. And, and that's something that was always kind of ingrained in me, the hard work, right. I think that comes from my family and, you know, not being a draft pick or anything like that. Sometimes it was tough, but it was, I think that thickened my skin a bit too. It got me ready for when things didn't go my way, how to handle it. And, and then once I got to Chicago, um, I played in Rockford a lot of games. I was in the East Coast the first year I got called up, and I played a lot of games in Rockford. I think that's when I really springboarded my career. You know, started, like, the confidence of that I do belong, right? I think at one point you're just there. You're almost happy to be there. Where when I played there, I really started to believe, like, I, hey, you know, I have the tools. I'm good enough. I can get a chance here. And, and then when I, when I got to Nashville, I really got a chance to play. And, you know, Mitch Korn helped me out a ton. Um, you know, he was really... He was hard on me in the sense of uh, what I needed to do and where I was lacking, but also was good to me, honest. And I think that's something I appreciate. Nowadays, sometimes there's too much, uh, you know, the politics of hockey, right? Where sometimes it's nice to be black and white. And that's something that Mitch was, Mitch was honest with me, told me when I needed to be better and what I needed to do. And, you know, I responded well to that. And I think the years past of, you know, some of the shortcomings helped me, uh, you know, deal with that on the mental side for sure. Now, what... Can you give us some examples? Because remember, I mean, all goalies in this audience, so when they hear you talk about things you needed to do differently, and obviously this is years ago and the game continues to evolve uh, for goaltenders at a pretty fast pace, but what, you know, looking back, what were some of the things that you get to that level, you'd had success in the AHL, and all of a sudden you've got a different voice, and you know, but what needed to change? Like, how's your game evolved? Like, yeah, I think for me, I, I always had that, like, you know, competitive edge, right? Like I was a battler. I've always been a battler. That's kind of all I ever had in that sense where my game lacked the structure, right? Like I, some of these kids that have gone to hockey schools their whole life and been on the rink and doing the right things right away where I never really had that, right? I just played hockey. We, I didn't have special coaches. I didn't have that, but I did have the edge to just, I knew how to battle and keep pucks out of the net. So I think once I got to a higher level, I really needed to work on that consistency of my structure. Um, which, which would bring me the consistency in my game that, you know, each night you kind of knew what you're going to get. And then when, when shit hit the fan in a game, I still had the ability, the natural athletic ability to battle and find pucks and, and do what I needed to do to keep the puck out of the net. But to find that consistency is what, you know, helped me stay. And uh, I, I think as soon as I recognized that and recognized using the resources around me to, you know, help my game, it was, uh, you know, really huge. I, I think Andrew Allen in Rockford, I was going to say, it was another voice. That Andrew Allen had. was unbelievable with me in Rockford. You know, we did a lot of homework. Andrew would work hard too. Sometimes we, we would find lots of clips of like NHL guys at the time when I was playing in the minors that I could like emulate my game around or like see different things. We, I, wa I used to watch a lot of Jonathan Quick just with some of the stuff he would do because I had that aggressiveness, but he's obviously the extreme. It's amazing what he can do. Um, but finding structure with some other guys too. And then I would watch other guys that had a little more structure in their game. like say a Luongo or someone who was a little more consistent in that. So trying to find that happy medium of who I can be, right? At that point, it was really tough to reinvent the wheel, but I could, you know, tweak what I needed to, you know, be the best pro goalie I could be and especially stay in the NHL. When you talk about structure, I mean, are we talking like tactical in terms of you know, where you are within a crease in certain plays? Or are we talking technical, like adapting post integrations? And, you know, it's just one example because it's evolved so much yeah. during your career. Or a little bit of everything. A little bit of everything, honestly. Uh, the post stuff was huge, right? I, I think I used to go VH on every post play. I, it's funny now, like the way I play now and being able to hook around posts and slide on my pads and get back into like an RVH to push from there. And I remember, I remember my first year in St. Louis, I didn't really know how to rotate back into the post like in a butterfly. And I remember working with Jake Allen. He kind of taught me how to do it. 
So it's, it's something funny, like you just, over the years, you play with different guys and there's little habits you pick up from each guy. And that's something I, I had no clue how to do it. And, he, you know, we kind of work now. I, I wrap my sticker on the post on my blocker side to like pull myself back in. And on my other side, I, I've just worked better at like using my glove and, and hinging back inside the post where I had no clue how to do that. I'd be up, down, sliding all over trying to find it. So it's something that uh, I always think that's a funny thing learning from your partner, but it's the way the game works. Well, I was going to say, if, if Jake didn't teach you, then David Alexander would have quickly while you were there because I know a lot of that. You know, I think he called it dynamic skating. I've yeah. seen some of those presentations and oh, this guy's always good at that in terms of being able to find that post and recover into it. You mentioned consistency. It's interesting to hear that because that's kind of what I always thought. Like technique can, I, as a looking from the outside, as someone who obviously never played at any type of level, technique's really sort of easy to identify. It's, it's just the easiest thing to see, but you need more than that to succeed in the NHL. You have to have more than that. But I've always kind of felt, like you said, technique is where your foundation and consistency can come from. So guys that rely too much on it, maybe aren't dynamic enough, but guys that don't have enough, they'll tend to ride higher highs and lower low. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree. I, I feel like growing up too, I'd play with guys that you consider them practice goalies. You'd like do practice with them and they'd be unbelievable. And, you know, you couldn't beat them. Everything was inside the vacuum, right? It was so easy. And then you get in a game and they could just never break that structure. They could never just at times you, at times it doesn't have to be pretty or it doesn't have to be, you know, specifically taught. You just got to make the save. And I think I've always had that element to my game and finding that, that consistency in my structure, you know, has made me a full-time NHL guy. Now, uh, other vo- now this year, yeah, I always see Andrew Allen last year in Buffalo, uh, Mike Bales this year. How, how do you, because there's a lot of different voices and you've had a lot of, you've talked about a lot of the guys that have helped you along the way, picking up different things from different guys. Does that have to be the approach? Open mind, but then also, you know, stick to or be firm with what you know works for you. How do you find that balance when, you're also probably trying to please different guys at different points in your career. Yeah, it's a happy medium, right? You know, you, you start to learn what you need to, you know, what makes you feel good, what gets you there. But then you have to be open minded to the fact of, you know, we're not perfect, right? And the game's constantly evolving. So you need to be, you know, kind of aware of the league and the way the game's played and other guys that are having success, why they're having success or, you know, why goals are going in. Um, and, you know, I think there's a trust with, whatever goalie coach you have. And, you know, Bales has been great. Um, I don't think Bales is trying to reinvent the wheel with me by any means, but, you know, very honest. We, we communicate well. Um, you know, he gets with me. He treats me like a veteran in that sense, right? You know, you know what I need. And, and some days it's a, some days it might be a boot in the ass or it's, or some days it's getting off early because, you know, you got to save a little, right? So he's been great. And I think for me, it's, it's, it's a weird time. There's so much information out there, right? Like you, you think about social media, you think about everywhere, goaltending is everywhere. And I think it's a great thing, but at the same time, it can be a little bit overwhelming for a younger player who, you know, doesn't really know his identity and doesn't really understand, um, you know, where he lacks or what he needs. So I, I think for me, the, my biggest strength is just self-awareness too, and just being able to recognize what I need or in that sense, what I'm missing at a certain time. So, so I, I think the quicker you learn, and understand the game and the position that you can help yourself out, right? Because at the end of the day, a goalie coach can do whatever, but, you know, you got to take care of yourself and, you know, it comes down to what, what you can do. You've talked about where that battle comes from. I mean, the work ethic of your family, your parents, like all those elements. How do you maintain that drive, that battle as an edge for yourself on a day-to-day basis within practice? Like, yeah, you, maybe you never lose it just because it is so instinctual and part of who you are, but... Are there things, you know, we talked about this before. We did an article on it, how sometimes, you know, goalie drills can be too structured if you, that's all you do. How do you, how do you maintain that sort of battle and that edge in a practice environment? Yeah, it's, it's tough, right? Especially over the course of a year, you know what I mean? It's a long season, 82 games and with all our practices and skating, you know, you're not going to be that guy every day, right? You know, there's going to be times, there's going to be moments in practice where, you know, it's there, you feel it, then there's going to be days you're a little bit off or a little slow and, so I think just the same idea is just the self-awareness too. Just the awareness of, hey, I, today was a rough one. I didn't have it today. And, and being able to find a way to, you know, come back tomorrow and be better. And, and I, I think that is a big, you just don't want to get into a lull. Um, you know, there's always times where everything is simple and easy and it's going smooth. And there's always going to be bumps in the road, especially as a goalie, right? Like you win as a team, sometimes you lose as a goalie. You know what I mean? There's, uh, it's lonely out there when things aren't going well. But I think you, that's where you got to trust in your work ethic and all that stuff. 
um, just to get you back to where you need to be. And, and I think that's where, you know, goalie coaches can come in and goalie partners and just communication of, uh, you know, getting yourself on the right track. And I, throughout a year, it's, it's a constant battle, but you have to trust in, you have to have trust in what you're doing. That's the right thing. Do you use video? Like a lot of guys I tell, talk to, one of the toughest things is to stick with what you're doing when goals go in, you can feel sometimes you can, you can feel that urge that you need to change something during a bad run, but then they go look at video and it's like, I wouldn't change a thing. How do you find, you know, like, how do you find that balance between, I guess it's the balance between process and results. Sometimes the process says can be good and the results still aren't there. Yeah. It's, 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 it's definitely tough. Right. And I, I think that's where like a confidence comes in to, to effect too. You, I think over my career, you notice a lot of young guys that can come in the league and you know, come flying out of the gate, right? And then all of a sudden, it, it just starts to wear away, right? And those guys don't last, and it's tough. And I think that's where the mental side comes in. It's so important, right? The way that you process and being able to move on from things and just continue on and, and not let things linger. And it's easier said than done, but that's another thing, like, over your career, you're, we're surrounded in the NHL with so many good resources, too, to use people, sports psychologists. And, uh, you know, I, I've worked with a few sports psychologists. It's something as a kid I... When I was younger, I always thought like you were weak if you used one. You were kind of like, you know, I don't need that. I'm tough. I'm, you know, and then you get to a point in your career where it's like going to the gym. It's the same thing. You're just strengthening your mind. You're just trying to make yourself more bulletproof. And and some to each person obviously is going to be different what each person needs, but it's another tool to have in your bag. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're, our careers are pretty short. So it's, you know, you want to maximize it, uh, you know, and it's a dog fight to stay here and to get in. And so you want to make sure you can be the best you can be. And I think that's a great uh, tool to have. Any example of something you can give us or share with kids, a technique that you've learned from a sports psychologist over the years, a mindset that you embrace to, to park a result or to move on or to get into the moment before a game, even one example. Yeah, like before games, I try to use a lot of like self-talk, just going over like things that like are strengths with me. Same th- Same thing, just self-awareness things, things that I know that, are positive reinforcers. Um, you know, I kind of, I'm pretty loose when I play and I try to have this time when I'm warming up before a game and just like getting dressed for warmups when I'm kind of trying to get into a, you know, into a zone. And I definitely use that. And then during games, for me, it's about like coming in and out of focus, right? Like you, for three periods and how long a game is, it's hard to be dialed in the whole time. So just trying to refocus on face-offs or say there's a TV timeout, I kind of get loose again and then go back to being focused. And for me during a game, it's all about breath. I try to work hard on uh, breathing um, when the puck crosses like a red line, like taking a breath and just relaxing and playing with flow. Right. Cause when you're tense, it's a lot harder to play. And Marty, Marty was a great one with helping me out with that. Right. We, when I was, when Marty came down was our goalie coach in uh, St. Louis, we talked a lot about like breathing as the play comes and some, I still, you know, work at. Right. And there's times where it's a tough night and you like, it slips away from you. And you know, it's just that reminder to go back to it and, it's kind of like your, your safe zone, right? You get back to breathing and relaxing and just playing. And there's so much pressures that come with what we do and, you know, points and wins and save percentage and agents and all the stuff. And, but a lot of things you just, it's just negative energy and things that you can't control. You know, you can only control what you can do out there and just kind of keep things in perspective and just battle and, you know, enjoy the moment. As I said, probably the easiest thing to say and the hardest thing to do, it seems golf and goaltending have this in common is one shot at a time. Definitely. It's, it's one of those things that like, you know, it can snowball quickly. Right. So I think if you can build that foundation to just have like, uh, something that calms you down and keeps you back in the moment, it's, it's so important because, uh, there's a lot of outside noise and things you can't control, but, but at times when it's, when it's not going well, it seems like it's all falling down on you. And, uh, you know, the quicker you can get her back to even keel, the better you are. Do you, we, we talk about goalie amnesia. I guess actually we don't, I've heard people use that phrase after, after a goal, for example. Do you have a routine that helps you park it and move on to the next one? How do you, how do you, what do you, what process do you go through to make sure that you're not still thinking about it when that next shot comes? Cause that's usually a recipe for disaster. Yeah. I try to do it on goals for and against just the same thing. When I was younger in college, we'd like score a goal and I would be like celebrating, you know, I'd be like pumped and real emotional. And then next thing you know, the faceoff comes and they're heading down for a chance and I'm still celebrating the goal that we just scored. Right. So I, I've kind of just, you know, try to be the same guy, whether it's a good goal, bad goal, we scored, the, you know, so just to find that consistency, same thing with breathing and just resetting myself and getting ready for what's coming next. Cause the, the hardest part about goaltending is it's easy. Some nights you're in that flow state and you're getting lots of shots, keeping busy. 
but you can't control what's going to come at you, right? No matter who you're playing or what you're doing, you don't know if you're going to get 12 shots or 50, right? So, so just being as consistent as possible, I think, has makes me as consistent as possible as a goalie, which, you know, brings the most success. You talk about, do you look, do you watch? Like, do you, do you think about the goal at all before you reset or just wipe it? Like, you watch it on the replay? Or? No, I, I try to, usually you know right away, like, there's obviously the odd one. Maybe it's like a screen or you, you're just kind of fooled by it totally. But for the most part, you understand, you know, what happened or, you know, it's always easy after the fact, you know, watch it in super slow-mo at five different angles. It's a super easy game from the press box. <laughs> yeah, 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 seriously. So, uh, you know, I just try to move on, right? It happens so fast, right? And especially some nights when you're in a you're in a tough rink or, you know, the crowd's humming down on you and you just got to just reset it and park it, like you said, and, and move on because... You know, you don't want to make that one become two or three. And, and next, you know, the game's out of reach because sometimes it's not how many you make. It's just like the time. And, and for me, I, th I think that's the biggest thing is just staying in the moment all the time. You've talked about flow. Um, have you read it? Have you, like, have you read stuff or done work on sort of that flow state and that concept and how you achieve it yourself? And also you play with a little flow in your game still. You still have, a, you know, a little backwards yeah. flow on rushes and stuff like that. Yeah, I have to. I think at my size too. You know, I think that's a strength of mine off the rush. But then as we get in zone, I want to stay a little deeper. You know, three quarter paint is where I kind of want to live. Um, but yeah, definitely flow state is something that you know you work at, and 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 honestly, one of the best things for focus concentration is going in and out of focus. Um, it's something that's like a proven fact that if you like focus, then relax and refocus. That's like a great way of staying. Uh, you know, finding flow state and being in it and. Uh, just having these conversations with sports psych people, bouncing ideas off them. And, uh, you know, Katie Turner, uh, she's our, she's our sports psych in Buffalo and she kind of meets with everybody. She's great. And even just bouncing things off her that we work at or I use already. And then hearing back like the actual, like physical evidence of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And I'm, I might not even know why I was doing it at the time. I knew it worked for me. And then her putting it into Big thing like, yeah, that's actually, you know, there's facts behind that. And so that's always reassuring and, and just being aware and, and trying to learn. I think it's a constantly evolving position, right? You know how it is. And I think of my 10 years professional, how much my game has changed and how much the game's changed, right? So it's kind of adapt to survive, you know? So it's something you have to be aware of if you want to do this for a long time. I can say the other thing you got to do if you're going to play for a long time is take care of yourself. want to make sure we give a little plug because she's been so good to us. Um, when did you start working with Maria Mountain and how does, how does that play into your, your off season and, and even your in season as well in terms of, man, this game is a grind and your guys' travel, it's not easy to bounce around the way you guys do and still sort of stay on top of things physically. Yeah. So Maria, I got hooked up with Maria after my first year in Nashville, I had tendonitis in my right knee that had bugged me for like two years. And I mean, I battled through it. It was, it was a pain. It was a thorn in my side the whole year practice everywhere it was always sore and you just played through it and I was still on that college like we were doing like Olympic lifts and it was just crazy right it was trying to, and I'm not just like the last thing you should be doing as yeah, a yeah. and you're I've sitting a few of those stories. and you're sitting here looking at me I'm not built for lifting a lot of weights so we uh we dialed it in we you know I worked with Maria we had some great conversations to start and you know her energy and her excitement toward what we do and and her craft is amazing and she's someone that honestly she like inspires you being around and so we set up a program and from there i, I jumped into it and i ne i've never had a smoother transition to the ice from when i switched over to her um body wise i think over the years i've been with her i don't think i, I i've missed a few games due to like things that have happened in games like hits or but it's never been like wear and tear I've been pretty solid wear and tear wise and, you know, knock on wood, obviously, but she's amazing. And, and we adapt every year, you know, uh, we communicate little things that come up and we add new things in. I, you know, if you watch me warm up for a game, you, you think I'm a maniac because there's so many little things that go into it, but it's all injury prevention. It's all about staying healthy. And the biggest thing we eliminate is, is I, I don't really lift a ton of weights. It's a lot of like dumbbell work and elastic bands and explosiveness and just being in like uncomfortable situations, working on core and, and having that ability that when I do get into an awkward position, still having body control. And it's something that, uh, you know, I give her a lot of credit for, you know, I, I've put the work in, but at the same sense, I've had the right guidance by her and she's been awesome. I wanted to ask you a little bit about hydration. I've noticed like, obviously coming off of practice, how much, how much, and I've noticed you consistently work in the water, but don't chug it. And I've noticed that with guys, whether it's after a goal, there's always water. And it's, I used to ask whether that was a reset mentally. 
But for a lot of them, it's just, hey, a reminder that I have to keep hydrating. Like for you, like what's the most you've lost weight in a game and all under all that gear, sweating as much as you do? Yeah, I, I think I'm like uh, like a crazy busy night for me is like seven, eight pounds. That's like my, I lose a lot of weight. Um, you know, a slow night for hydration cramping is, was an issue for me before. Like when I first came in the league, I would always cramp. I w- it was like a sure thing I was going to cramp. Calves, definitely. Sometimes hand, blocker hand would always be bad. Um, now it's now it's been really good. I, I've worked really hard at it. Uh, the way I prepare, you know, night before, day of, things that I take during the game. And, and I think it goes back to now just the mental side, the control of breathing and relaxing and, and not being so peaked all the time. I try now too, when I come to the bench on TV timeouts, take off my helmet, towel off a bit, try to just... Because you know how a helmet, it's almost like putting the top on a kettle, right? You take that off. It, See the steam coming out when yeah, you take def- it off? Yeah, it definitely helps. So stuff that I, I think when I was in Nashville, I really started to get aware of like how much I was dealing with, you know, sweating and hydration. And uh, and they always told me stories about Dan Ellis being a bad sweater when he was there. He was the one. I think he, and he's not, he was a pretty thin guy and he was like 15 some odd pounds, maybe even more in a game. Yeah. So, so they would tell me about him and then he started same idea. So I kind of got into that protocol, taking my helmet off and just letting the steam go. And then in between each period, I, I take off chest protector. We dry it out. We do everything, change shirts. So I can really, I usually use an ice towel after each period. Um, you know, depending on how the period goes, sometimes it's, you know, a quiet night, but for the most part, it's usually pretty busy in this new NHL. You know, everybody's buzzing in your zone all the time. So it's, uh, something you had to be aware of and it's, it's definitely helped. Okay. So we're going to have to extend this for two minutes because I forgot that you can't take a left into your hotel from the street. <laughs> we get to go around the block one more time. I swear this wasn't Millard. Darren Millard is going to hear this. This was just Woodley trying to get, he, he always bugs me for one more question, one more question. <laughs> and this is like, I swear this wasn't planned. Um, so as I try and navigate this, uh, did, did you have to, you essentially come up with a hydration plan? Like, are you like, do you, does it even start the day before? Just yeah. Constantly making sure you're constantly drinking water? lots of Pedialyte, um, electrolyte packets, um, you know, different pills, try to stay away from certain foods. Um, just, just trying to take care of my body as much as possible now and sleep for me. Sleep is huge at this point. I'm not a big napper anymore. I used to be when I was younger and then I got to about 28, 29. It was like, I couldn't nap anymore. And I felt that if I forced a nap and I, I would like be groggy later on when it came to game time. Uh, I just never got it back. So now I'm like a. So you don't nap. I'm like a 10, 15 minute power nap. That's it. How many, like how many guys? I don't know. Do think, I, I like think I'm pretty, pretty rare. Short list. Yeah. I think I'm pretty rare. And honestly, I think it's something that I would say that when I started to manage that, my game has had a lot more success. You like think a lot that more grogginess success. of waking up? Cause sometimes yeah. guys, you just, your body. I don't know how really... to explain it, but I feel like anyone would understand it. Like, you know, those times where you have a long nap and you just never really feel as sharp later on. Absolutely. And no matter how much caffeine or whatever I took to try to get up, it just never really came back to me. Well, and caffeine's not going to help with the hydration. No, issue. no, exactly. Right. So it's a happy medium. So for me, yeah. And that's kind of, so I'm a big, like making sure I get a good night's sleep the night before. And, uh, now with kids too, it's, you know, our kids go down seven, seven thirty. We're ready for bed anyway. So it's, uh, it's a good excuse cause they're getting up early. So, uh, okay, it's good to know I'm not the only one. Yeah. You know, cause once they're getting up, everyone in the house is getting up. So my wife does a good job, uh, you know, sheltering me from that. Right. She, she understands that what I do and how important it is. And, but at the same time, uh, you know, just finding that, that key to success and always kind of tweaking that routine, you know, once you learn more and there's so much information out there now, right. So you have to be open to changing if something isn't working. Last one. Cause Linus will kill me if I don't ask what's like, what, how's your, how's your, how's your setup been tweaked over the years? What, How's your gear changed? You walked us through it last year. we got a video. Yeah. Anything changed this year? Is that all yeah. still pretty much apply? No, I have, uh, I have a new, what did I, well, I ha, I'm not in it yet. I'm just about in there. Uh, I have, I have a new chest protector, Kineski, uh, okay. but I have Vaughn body Kineski arms. Okay. We've seen a few guys. Cause actually, I find those arms are like superior to anything that I've seen. We've seen a few guys in CCM chest and Kineski arms for sure. Uh, and then I, I switch knee pads. I kind of have these homemade our trainer, George Babcock's great. He's kind of docked them up for me, but they're bigger. I used to have those, those tiny ones. So I've tried to get a little bigger just so the inside knee, just a little easier on my hips. And that's been a pretty smooth transition. This summer, I just put them on and went with them and it's been great. And then I switched to out of Premier into E-Flex. Same thing I, I found last year. 
I don't know if it's an age thing now or just the grinds of the season. I just found the premieres are so stiff that when I get in them, uh, it's really tough during the season, especially when you break out a brand new pair and it's January and you, there's not a lot of time to practice and break them in. And the E-Flex has been great though. So it's been uh, a smooth transition there. And I always send, uh, you know, Linus is always telling me what I should do for colors and, you know, he's right into it and no, he's great. He's been, uh, he's a good kid and he's playing, he's playing great too. We got you here alive back to the hotel. Carter, thanks so much for doing this. I hopefully, uh, the, the, the goalies in cars or whatever we're going to call this. I didn't have any coffee. There's no coffee shop at the end of this, but, but we got you to the nice team hotel. So that works. Dude, thanks so much for doing this. I no really problem. appreciate it. No I problem. know I'm glad our listeners I can... are going to love this. No, it's great. I obviously have been great to me over my career and obviously I am glad to help out and share a little insight into, uh, you know, our world. Perfect. Thank you very much. Around the block, around the block, you are um, a fibber. You knew you couldn't turn left. Didn't <laughs> I you? do know I couldn't turn left, but to be honest with you, I totally forgot. And I just instinctively turned right because normally I'm going to Rogers Arena, their hotel. They're staying at the JW Marriott, which is right next door to Rogers Arena. So where I turn gets me to Rogers Arena, but I can't pull into the JW parking lot. So I had to go around the block. I knew, As soon as I did it, I'm like, oh, Millard is going to think I'm stalling for an extra question for sure. I didn't. I didn't with Freddie Anderson. There's a nice little tease for some content we've got next week in the car with Frederick Anderson, the goalie, the goalie for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, I could have gone around the block on him and got an extra five minutes. Instead, I just pulled over and cut it short. So you yeah. know, like it wasn't on purpose, but you try riding in a car in Vancouver traffic, trying to think about your route planning and conduct a conversation while holding a microphone and checking the levels of the guy sitting next the to only, you. Yeah, well, that's the hard part. But the only thing I'll say is uh, to uh, to make that adjustment in your navigation, you didn't have to go across the Lionsgate Bridge and then come back. Uh, all the way back downtown. So that, that was a bit of a, an extreme. I'm kind of like the New York cab well driver done. trying to milk people for extra fare. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just for extra questions. One more. Carter, Carter I just great. got one more. We're going to go around the block. Maybe two. That's, uh, that's nice that we've got the New York Taxi Cab Association on our back now. That's, uh, that's a good target for us. <laughs> We're getting all kinds of Christmas plugs in. And, and if I could be so bold as to get one of my own in, I'd loved yes. uh, all of all of the mindfulness uh, discussion from Carter Hut- uh, from Hutton. And, uh, and in fact, as we were doing it, I, I clipped out a piece of it and I went into one of the uh, articles on premium that was written by our good friend, Pete Fry on um, the fan mindset versus the athlete mindset. And I took that little clip out of the interview and I put it into Pete's article because it fit absolutely perfectly where, where Carter's talking about um, being stuck in the fan mindset as a, as a university player. And uh, so it fit beautifully with something on premium. And I just wanted to, to get a word out there for Pete that uh, if you live in the Ottawa area, the Kingston area, or Vernon, British Columbia, um, Pete's going to be doing one day seminars um, on goalie mindset training uh, for some, for, well, for goaltenders and, and for parents. Uh, one of the things that are great about his uh, seminars is that a parent who registers their, their goaltender can actually join, join in on the seminar with them as a freebie. So just check it out. There's uh, links on in goal and on our regular newsletter. Thanks for bringing up that fan mindset because that was uh, fascinating that goaltenders at such a high level can still struggle with, uh, with staying in their lane or being in the right lane, uh, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, and uh, we've talked about this before. Mental training is, I think, one of the next big things for goaltenders just because... You know, it's it's kind of like not it's like spending two thousand bucks on pads and not bothering to put new steel on your skates. Like if you can't move, the pads aren't going to help you. And I think that mindset is such a big part of the position, a big part of the game. Um, we should pay a little more attention to how we train it. Pete's great for that. Obviously, we've attended his seminars with him and John Stevenson in the summer. Uh, and when you have guys that are playing professional hockey, NHL drafted, playing in the minors right now, on their way to pro careers, showing up to the seminars who already work with Pete because they want to hear more from them and get more insights into how they can be better between the ears because they know it'll make them better between the pipes. Uh, certainly would suggest it's a worthwhile investment for everyone else to check out the articles and maybe check out one of his seminars if you're in the location. Oh, I hope Pete's listening. He just got a new slogan out of you there, Woody. 
be better between the years and you'll be better between the pipes. That's fantastic. I tra- I just trademarked that. So he's going to have yeah, to. I think so. Yeah, we're yeah, we're going to charge for that one. Maybe we can come up with a jingle. It's a hell of a lot better than Ask Cam. Yeah, I was going to say, we, we got a whole new company. Whid- Whid- Whidley's, Whidley's thinking, Ask Pete? Did I come up with that? <laughs> Ask Kevin. <laughs> Ask David. It's it's perfect. It works for everybody. Hey, uh, congratulations on uh, on that one. Uh, the the Carter Hutton one was was spectacular, and uh, he's a guy that that you just he he oozes normalcy, and that's not any type of uh, slant or shot at any anybody else. But he just he just feels like he's he's your regular buddy. Yeah. that uh, that that came across. Good dude, and also a good plug for one of the the great people in goaltending, Maria Mountain, who he's worked with, and as you heard him say, like just totally transform his game by helping him transform his body. So there's another little slogan uh, between the ears. That's and between how I, the pipes. That's how I learned about Carter Hutton was was through Maria Mountain and following her. And I came I came to sort of be educated on on Carter Hutton and his his journey through that way. So it's interesting that you bring that. And a little tease because uh, you, you mentioned some of the insights uh, we got uh, in interviews. Uh, managed to get one in the can just for people know when 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 Darren teased uh, our interview in the car not in the can in the can means an interview that you get early and put you were such a child why you thought people might think that we were interviewing people in the bathroom i thought that's how it sounded so i got one in the can but not the literal can the proverbial radio can i have an interview banked with nora ratti from finland uh you're supposed to roll the r she tells me how i probably just butchered it again i suck at names i'm like the don cherry of this podcast with names um and frederick anderson next week and hutch i'm pretty sure we will for our in goal premium listeners chance to listen to the interview itself on its own ahead of the podcast release on the in goal premium website absolutely we should have that up by monday at the absolute latest uh i hope everybody's enjoying this podcast and realize that any three 12 year olds can put together a goaltending podcast yep it's uh it's brilliant uh do you do you guys plan on putting the picture of freddie uh in front of the computer uh, up on Ingle Premium. Well, actually, you know what I was compiling this morning was just a few quick little clips of him doing his pro read, and you can see him sitting at Woody's computer, hanging onto the Ingle mic. And we're not going to give give it all away. So there's already been one person upset at me on Facebook because one of our little teases ended without giving all the goods away. Um, this won't give all the goods away, but we will show you uh, what it's like to work behind the scenes with Woody. The and guys, we had a we had an in goal premium, an in goal magazine, an in goal radio first this week. So pro reads. Hopefully, people know what they are by now. It's me sitting down with NHL goaltenders, going over their saves, um, their execution, and them telling me what they see in a play, so that you can see how a goaltender at the NHL level processes the game when they look off the puck, what they read in terms of body language of a shoot potential shooter, how they read a threat, what lanes are open, how they read their own defenseman. Like it's been fascinating. Uh, Freddie's visit was the first guy that said, yeah, Hey, I kind of saw that with, with Carrie price. Like I saw that you were doing that. It seems like a really cool idea. I'm in, we sat down for 15 minutes and went over his footage. First time though, we actually had the goalie coach say, Oh, if you're doing that, I got to save. You need to see great read. We see him look off the puck and actually sent me the footage on his iPhone of Freddie's save. And so when we get into pro reads, there will be all of a sudden there'll be one where Freddie's not looking at my computer. He's looking at a tiny little iPhone. And that's because thank you, Steve Brier sent me the clip for Freddie to review. Cause it was a great example of a goalie looking off the puck and making his read and making a save because of it. So the first time ever we've actually got the NHL goalie coaches sending us the clips to go over with their goalies. Cause they know that other goalies are going to see that and benefit from it. See, that's why we didn't call it Ingle blah, Ingle average. We called it Ingle premium because it has that type of incredible content. Uh, we have to take a little bit of a, a break here and uh, walk away because we have to get some Christmas shopping done. Uh, if you are a goaltender and you want uh, some great uh, gift ideas uh, for your mom and dad or your spouse uh, or your kids want something that uh, they can give you, Check out uh, the hockey shop, thehockeyshop.com, source for sports, sorry, or ingoalmag.com and uh, ingoal premium. Make it easy. Get what you want. Tell them what you want. That's what you do. Uh, for Kevin Whitley, David Hutchison, I'm Darren Millard. I'd like to thank Carter Hutton as well as uh, Cam from the hockey shop. We will chat with you next week on Ingoal Radio, the podcast. <laughs>